All right, here we go. What's good, everybody? I'm Robert Dickens Jr. This is Ryan Reed. This is Elanders Frazier. This is John Gall, and you're listening to Volta. Changing the conversation for percussion educators, designers, and performers. John, let's try that again. And you're recording in three... What's up, everyone? John Gall here with the crew, Ryan, Alanis, and Robert. How are you guys doing, everybody? Doing well, doing well. Coronavirus free, so I'm excited. Absolutely. <laughs> doing real well. <laughs> <laughs> I love this group of people. Hands down, y'all are awesome. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, oh, man. <laughs> This is pretty funny. What you guys have not seen are all the bloopers to get to this point right now. We should release a video of just the bloopers. <laughs> but good. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. <laughs> and what's up, Drum Drumcore Nation? So as you guys already know, we're going to be dropping some value bombs. Stick with us. There you go. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> I swear when I looked at it, it said Ryan's name, and then your name like jumped up there, and then it muted you. It sucks, man. Wow. Just keep on going. Just keep on going. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's. We're just gonna just keep on going. Yeah. Was sad. We can we're cut this stuff out. out nah, here. this is fun. Like a bunch of boomers. We <laughs> are. <laughs> 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 Today's conversation, we'll be talking about writing and how it relates to teaching and you guys' experience, uh, how you got into the writing gig, which came first, the writing or the teaching. So let's just start right up. Ryan, how about you start us off? What's your experience when it comes to writing? What, what got you interested in it? Uh, was it teaching first or, or what? Um, for me, I think it was performing got me interested in doing it and seeing how that whole process kind of laid out because I, when I, for my first teaching gig was a really small high school uh, and I was the percussion instructor and the arranger and that's how I really got started in both teaching and writing. It was just both simultaneously and it's funny to look back now at those first couple jobs that I did teaching wise and writing wise and going all right if I knowing what I know now it's like man those first couple books I wrote I was trying to give everything I had to those students and at the time I was like man this is really great and now in 2019 that would have been back in 2005 so in 2019 I looked at that stuff and go man what was I thinking when I wrote some of that stuff just in terms of as you, as you grow experience wise, you learn what is cleanable, what is attainable, what sounds good, how to phrase, all of that stuff. So I really got into it simultaneously and had to grow from there. But it wasn't until a couple years ago where I really got into like writing is going to be my business because I had a music ed degree and I had my license for five years. I applied for a number of jobs uh, as a band director and just. I got a couple interviews out of it, but but I never got a job out of it. So I was doing this thing. I was writing and teaching kind of part-time and like making some money, but still at home and whatnot. And then I said, you know what? I just, rather than pay for a bunch of school and renew my license that I still don't know if I'm going to get a job, I'm just going to go like full force into the writing teaching thing. And that's when I kind of buckled down and really turned it into like, a full-time craft instead of like a part-time thing. Now <clears throat> you were doing, you, you were writing full on shows. Like you didn't even start with warm ups or exercises maybe for your own high school pit. You just jumped right in and, and started diving into the, the meat and potatoes, I guess you could say. Well, I, the, the first, the first job was doing the whole thing. So, I mean, the, the first job I had was like a, a, a real small drum line. I was the only percussion instructor so it was a real small drum line a real small pit and I was I was writing exercises for both group both halves of the ensemble and writing the the book for both halves of the ensemble 
So it's kind of, you know, learning by fire at that sure. point. Now, Elanders, do you think it's wise to just jump right in for people who are, who are new to the writing activity and write both the battery and the front ensemble parts? Like, we're not even going to talk about the electronic soundscape yet. Uh, or do you, do you prefer uh, focusing on one niche, so just battery or just front ensemble? Uh, that's a great question, John. I think it really depends on your opportunity. Because, you know, if you've got the experience to do both and somebody gives you the opportunity to do it, do it. I mean, so many times in life do we miss out on experience and growth because we don't jump on opportunities right when they happen. So even if you're a first year teacher and you get that opportunity, whether you're, you know, as they say, in the deep end or not, reach out to contact, start contacting people, start using this wealth of the information technology age that we're in to get help, but don't miss that opportunity if it's presented to you and you have the skill set to be able to do it. So I want to make it very clear about understanding having the skill set to be able to do it, because it's one thing if you've never done something before, but you don't have any foundation versus you already have a foundation set up and you're just waiting on that opportunity and maybe there's a little hesitation there because it's not really something that you've done before. So I kind of, you know, allude that to the same thing about when, you know, everybody or I can assume all four of us started teaching. We had the skill set. We may not have done it before, but we had the information to be able to do that. And what we lacked was the opportunity once we got the opportunity, we either jumped on that opportunity and said, all right, let's jump right in, or we were hesitant and maybe we got passed up and somebody else got that opportunity and we're like, what are they doing? They don't even have the same foundation that I have, but they were unafraid to take the opportunity when it was presented. So sometimes you've got to let that fear go by the wayside and go ahead and jump in and kind of test your waters because you're going to, everything's going to be a growth and a learning experience. And as long as you treat it that way and never stop learning, but always continue to ask for guidance along the way and lean into your, your own, you know, experience and initiative, not, not initiative. What's the word? Uh, intuition. Then I think you're going to be just fine by the end of it. Robert, you've, you've been writing and teaching for a long time now. Can you give us maybe some personal examples uh, from right when you started writing for a group to maybe five years in to now how long you've been doing it in the activity of some, uh, maybe some obstacles you ran into uh, or some, some challenges you had to overcome? Um, for me, uh, just to go back to your first question and kind of link it to this one, uh, I started out teaching first, um, and the way that I kind of got into writing was uh, just finding different parts in the book uh, that were, the group that I was with at the time was using a pre-written book, and there were things that I just felt were just kind of underwhelming. It's just like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's the end of the drum feature. Why? That sounds like trash. Like, why would anybody do that? That's really boring and uninspiring. <laughs> It's like I go in and I change like these four bars or like change the ending of it to just make it, you know, make it more exciting. The kids liked it and I felt like it had a better musical effect. So that's kind of where I kind of came in. You know what I mean? Like I kind of started by just finding things. One, because the group that I was with at the time, it was my first year there and the band director already had a pre-written show. So it's kind of like, at that point, I didn't get the opportunity to write my own book because that was the structure that was already set up. But I was able to make little tweaks here and there. And that's kind of how I got my foot, you know, into writing and doing things like that was just finding ways to tweak things. And then over the years, I started to understand the students more and start to understand what their skill sets were and what was achievable for them in the amount of time that I could rehearse them. And I felt like that was where I kind of started to put my own stamp into writing and arranging for the groups that I work with. So 
Um, one of the advantages that uh, I think is there for people that write for their own groups is that you understand those kids' personalities really well and you know what style they'll probably gravitate towards and like what they can achieve over a certain period of time. So that's kind of more so why I, uh, how I got, uh, I guess, into the whole writing thing and composing, so. Cool. And can we follow up maybe with that second question? You were talking about how you, when you write for your kids, you really know their skill set, their personalities. Has any personalities uh, over the years provided some obstacles for you as you've written? Let me clarify, like one, for example, I'm, I'm sorry for butting back in, but let's say you wrote something because the kids really asked you to put it in there uh, and maybe they didn't either practice hard enough or it was actually a little too easy and you had to beef it up. Like wh where, when do you, when do you uh, know what to do? Sorry, it's like a multi, multi question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, to me, I think, and this is my personal philosophy, um, if the music is written, if the music is written well and written appropriately as far as the difficulty level, I feel that the student shouldn't be able to 100% achieve it until the end of the year. However, I do feel like a good 70% of that, they should be able to achieve right out the gate. Like it should be readable as to what they're playing. Maybe there are certain nuances and details that they need to work on and their chops need to grow to get get to a place to be able to play it at a certain level of virtuosity but they should be able to achieve 70 percent of it like right out of the gate like they understand how to do it and i feel like some of that overlaps because of the educational process and i think that that's one of the things that helped me within my composition was understanding the skill sets better and making sure that the people that I write with or collaborate with understand the skill set so that I make sure my training program sets students up to play exactly what skill set that I want them to do. I feel that the exercise program should pretty much take care of, I would say, maybe 80 to 85% of that. Of course, I, I tend to feel like maybe like that 10 to 15 percent of like something that's a little bit beyond what they're able to do that's in the pack it like there should be that one bit of challenge in there that it's like okay i may need to make some exercises for them to really be able to do this one specific thing but that's kind of something that i put more on the students that's like hey if you like this part you feel like it's cool you want to challenge yourself then you got this length of time to be able to get it up to this level i think that's usually a motivating factor for them to be like okay like i like this back sticking i like <laughs> one permutation part like i'm not gonna you know let it get cut i'm gonna actually start practicing it even though it's outside of you know our quote unquote warm-up skill set so what's really cool uh at least for me <clears throat> is well first of all a little background i don't write for any group you guys have way more experience in writing than me because you guys do it for a living. For me, I just don't believe the amount of time and effort and the amount of financial compensation you get is kind of worth it. And we can talk about that for an another video. But I, I say that all to say, I learned a lot about writing. I do more exercises for my front ensemble and, and, and for my battery. I learned just to be super aware when I was a performer. Right, there's like no experience uh, writing at all. I learned just to look at the music I was given from my instructors, both at the high school level and at the drum corps, uh, and just kind of see what they were doing. Like I remember auditioning for Mystique and Cavaliers early 2013, 14, 15, that time, and just comparing how Eric Johnson wrote old Cavi books and how Matt Jordan kind of created his own influence from that as well as how Alan Miller used his own influence from Eric and, and kind of morphed their own take. I can now, as a performer, see where everyone's coming from, those different inspirations, see what I like as from a new, new writer, I guess you could say, and then kind of throw in my own spin uh, now that I'm older. And even at the time when I was still performing, I would make exercises up and write them down, either by paper and pencil or Sibelius or Finale, whatever. And kind of just like, okay, Eric would do a run here and Alan Miller would do some block chords here and, and Matt Jordan would do a crazy permutation here. I could do that or I could maybe try something new over here. What, what influences 
Ryan or influencers, I should say, Ryan, have really taken a hold part of your writing? Um, I, I think for me, obviously, I've, I've got to say Rob Ferguson, just because I, I marched three years of Matrix and he was the front ensemble arranger when I was at Glassman and he and I are in the same design company. So he would, he's been the biggest influence just because I've been around his music the most and I've been teaching it for so long and whatnot. So I definitely hear some of his influence in my writing. And I think that's, I think that's going to be true of everybody that does the writing thing is that you're going to hear influences from past instructors, past books they've played and that kind of stuff. And, and as somebody new getting into it, I think that's almost, how you have to start if I think about like my start thinking about like everything that I heard, I was just like, all right, how can I use that to build my voice and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, one thing to always keep in mind as somebody that's like trying to break into it and they're like, I want to set the world on fire. There's, there's only so many rudiments and there's only so many major <laughs> scales and notes and they've all been used before. So what, what is groundbreaking is just maybe a new variation on a thing that we've been using since, you know, Bach was around and, and Renaissance music. So I think all of those things are our influences and how we develop our voices, at least for me, because I know the older I get, the more I want to experiment with like, this is what I would kind of do, but I want to do things a little bit different. What about you, Alanders? What influencers have affected your writing style? I honestly, and I like to say this very proudly, I'm such a fan of the marching percussion community, hands down. I, there, I think there are people that get into it for the, you know, for the career aspect of it, but I think the career aspect of it is cool but I think the performance and watching performance, the fan aspect of it is just, it's even cooler to me. And I think that lives and breathes in my music because for the life of me, I am never satisfied with one interpretation of something. I think if there's a new way to do it, if there's a different way to do it, let's try it, let's get in there. And I think because I ingest so much stuff, I mean, Rob can attest to this hands down, because I send him these random messages about <laughs> stuff that I am watching in, on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock because I just, I can't stop. Like it's, it's addicting almost to where I'm constantly ingesting DCI and WGI and college band stuff. Like it, it, like if it has something to do with this idiom, I've probably seen it once and I probably got it saved on a playlist somewhere. And I kind of use all of that in my, you know, tool bag because I don't think that limiting yourself to one style or one idiomatic interpretation really gets the point across in the activity that we do because there's so many different ways that you can do it. And I think that if you, as a writer personally, I think as long as you stay in the vein of the music, feel free. And, and I think that's kind of where, you know, I always settle in is, does this feel like the music that you're playing? You know, if you're playing a Latin chart, and I love Latin music, if you're playing a Latin chart, you, you got to do stuff that's in a Latin chart. And, you know, I get it. It's marching percussion. We got to throw some rudiments in there. But you know what? I'm also going to throw some cross shots in there. I'm also going to throw you know, some stick clicks that sound like, you know, three, five clave. Like I'm all, I'm like I'm all in when it comes to the style of music, whatever it takes. I've seen some writers that take that route. And then I've seen some writers that are like, you know, I got to fit 37 notes in this bar. I, you know, I don't care what kind of music it is. It's like, oh. but was that the choice that you really wanted to make? Or did you feel that you had to make that choice because of, you know, whatever the activity, et cetera? So I think as a, you know, I, I try not to limit myself to just what our activity has to offer. And I think that for me personally, listening to the source music a lot, especially when I'm writing, that really helps breathe life into the creativity of what I'm doing. Because, you know, if I can hear something like four different ways, but then I hear 
just that little tidbit of the source music, whether it's a classical piece or a pop tune, that's what my mind like picks out of there and then, for lack of a better word, throws it up in the form of like rudiments. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just like you hear just that little bit of, oh, that's from the original chart. If you go back and hear it, it happened right here at this moment. Like that's just kind of how I've always heard music um, because I'm a big fan of music and I'm just a big fan of just this activity in general. Now, that's not to say that I don't have some things to continue to strive to get better at, because Lord knows these days, these kids can play way more stuff than I can play. So I've got to continue to grow in getting out of the box of what I can actually play and thinking, okay, well, maybe this can actually be played here. I know I can't actively do it, but I know somebody can. And usually when I think that way, these kids surprise me every time because they can do it a thousand more different ways than I ever could think of it. So I just throw out some stuff and see what they can do. And if they can't handle it, then we recycle and try something else. Sure. I really liked what, like, what you're trying to get across there is that, is that dilemma I think all writers have is between the artistry, the creative aspect, as well as just trying to figure out what works best in this phrase that's going to take us from a to b from a design holistic standpoint rod <clears throat> excuse me roberts <laughs> i don't know why i said rod. roddy 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 oh, roddy rod. <laughs> <laughs> rob what 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 how do i want to phrase this question i guess since you've written so much with your with your groups and you've also been i guess not really an inspiration but definitely a helpful partner with the landers when writing the battery book for southwind like what conversations do you have with him and, and ryan ryan please chime in as well because you guys talk a lot about this uh when it comes to the creative artistry aspect of putting what you want, what you hear from the source material, or if it's just your own making stuff up and very original composition, what do you know, like when do you know to put some artist creativity side into it? And when do you know that you just need to get from A to B and help from a holistic design? We just gotta make sure that things are solid. Robert, can you start? I always think about the scientific uh, more technical side of it first, like you just said. Um, I, and Alanders and I have kind of talked about this, which I feel like is an interesting point. Um, the connection between the training aspect and the performance aspect of the music design, you know, both of those things are designed together because we were having a conversation about early 2000s Vanguard and late 90s Vanguard, early 2000s, and the the way that the music was between Jim Casella and Murray Gusick. And we kind of wonder, like, did, you know, the arranger kind of come up with these phrasings and the way that this is? Or is that something that inspired him from the book and or from the warm up book, if, if you're getting what I'm saying? So one of the things that I kind of talk to Landers about is I always think about, obviously, like we have to hit certain skill sets and teaching them what it is that they need to know. But at the same time, I feel like my approach is that I need to be just as artistic in the way that I present the training program so that I'm teaching them to approach the music with an artistic value as well. So I do think about, let's say, for instance, okay, a paradiddle exercise uh, that we work on, you know, one of the things that's important is understanding how to take a tax off of different uh, parts of the ensemble and understanding whether or not your part within the battery is a texture or whether or not it's kind of like the melodic content that is being heard more prevalently. I took that approach to writing the paradiddle exercise that we came up with because I wanted them to be able to understand that in a musical context, okay, at some point in time, the bass drums may be the primary voice and the snares and quads are playing a part that's just the texture underneath that. Or it may be the other way around, where the snare drums are more so the primary voice. And I think that that's a little bit different in, uh, than what we're kind of used to, in that back in the day, it was kind of like the music was more vertically orchestrated. 
in that, say for instance, you know, snare lines are playing flam drags, the quads are playing flam drags, but they're just playing it around the drums and the bass drums are playing the exact same thing, but they're just playing it in a split. You know, nowadays music, uh, as you know, WGI has grown, DCI has grown. Each voice within the battery now seems to have its own like set of rudiments and its own set of things and ways that it punctuates the music. So for me, I always keep that in mind so that I make sure that again, the training aspect has just as much artistry as the you know the the music design because we know we're trying to get from point A to one point B. Like everybody knows we want to be clean. Everybody knows we want your taps to be low. Everybody knows you want your accents to have weight and to have sound. I also know that the students want to look cool, so they want to have some type of stick tricks and like there has to be a, a, a cool aesthetic to what it is that we're playing. You know what I mean? So it's like I know all of those things. My job as the you know person that's coming up with it is like, how do I make all these cool things that are happening? make scientific sense so that they're actually reinforcing the skill set that they actually need. And that's a challenge that I kind of welcome that I feel like is cool is like, okay, how do I make this technically sound, but I also make this like groovy and interesting so that like anybody would want to listen to what it is that we're playing. Sure. I think you hit the nail right on the head when you said it all comes down to the skill set of the student. Right. I, we have all seen tons of students who want to come in and, all right, why, why isn't Southwind doing this uh, exercise like the Blue Devils? Or why aren't, why aren't Southwind doing this exercise like SCV? Well, with the age range that we typically see, though, like we're not at that caliber yet. Right. It, it takes years of feeding. And even this could be for any high school. Uh, opportunity. Some high schoolers, uh, high schools just don't have the feeder program, like multiple middle schools going in. So sometimes you're just having to reteach from freshmen and you're just going to see them four years. Whereas other high schools, maybe the percussion director has the opportunity with some assistance to already start teaching middle schoolers in the sixth grade. Like I know in Texas, some schools are very just just have that opportunity while others do not. So I think it all goes back to the skill set of the students, making sure they're creating that you're creating a, a strong fundamental foundation for them so that as an instructor, not only does the student get the foundation, but you're able to pepper in some of that cool nuances that you were talking about. Ryan or, or, or Landers, you want to you want to jump in and share your input about this? I think Rob always kind of coins it perfectly, kind of said that in the last video. He just always has the way. But what I've, what I've found, in, especially since our time kind of working hand in hand, is that I pick up influences off how he sees the world through his music versus how I see the world through my music. And I, I especially like this last year, I mean, I bounced ideas off him constantly while I was writing to make sure that A, he's, he's the functional guy. I mean, he is gonna let me know, yo, this don't feel good in the hands. I need you to change this, this, and this, cause it's gonna feel better. And I trust that advice because I don't know everything myself. You know what I mean? Like something may feel good to me that doesn't feel you know, good another way. And it's like, you wanna try to find that balance. And then I also think that, you know, trying to find artistry in today's mainstream in terms of, how we, you know, approach marching percussion is so delicate because, you know, we've kind of had the discussion before where it's like a Tom Unk's book is different than a Dave Glide Scott Johnson book. It's different than a Mike McIntosh book. It's different than a Colin McNutt book. You know what I mean? And each of them kind of have signatures, but you can tell, you know, what they're trying to do when, you know, when they sit down and they functionally write items. So I think what we've tried to do is not necessarily hold ourselves inside of a, this is our signature sound. Yeah, there are some signature things that I do, like double paradiddles. I just love them. Um, but I, I think that we've tried to find a way to be a melting pot among ensembles to where it's like, you may think you have an idea of what our signature is, but then you actually don't because we switch it up on you constantly. And I like that concept because it's kind of like a playlist, you know what I mean? Like a Spotify playlist that has everything. 
You know, you're not going to come here and you're not going to get Drake's whole album. You're going to get, you know, a lot of different artists sprinkled in there. It may all be in the same vein, but there's going to be those differences in there that really gives you that freshness and that variety, et cetera. And I think kind of having somebody to bounce those ideas off of really, really helps because then you don't get kind of set in your own ways of just, you know, doing things the way that you do them a certain way, but trying to think outside of the box a little bit in terms of how you share those concepts and ideas. Uh, even Ryan has influenced me on certain stuff when we're writing together to where he's like, I kind of hear it this way. And I'm like, I agree. And then we go through the editing process. So I think there's a lot of different ways that you can do it, but I think we've tried to set up a, a melting pot idea and concept so that the kids can stay engaged, but also that it just, it's something new that can, has not really been tried before. I would also tag onto that. Um, as a front ensemble arranger, I'm always think, trying to take the, the concept of a show into consideration. Like if you look at our, our 2019 production page, um, one, one of the first conversations that Alanders and I had, we were just talking about like, what does caged sound like? and that kind of stuff and how to set up the soundscape, not just electronically, but acoustically. And, you know, thinking back to like when we were at move-ins the day we went to, to Lowe's and we're like buying chain <laughs> and then hitting metal yeah. sheets with chain to see what sounds the best, because that's, that's what caged was, you know, caged was, you know, chains on a vibraphone from a prepared to get a prepared vibraphone sound that like I had witnessed in college, like somebody taped pennies to a vibraphone for a piece to get that sound. I was like, oh, that's a cool kind of rattly sound. That would be awesome here. The concert snare drum had chains on it. So just trying to keep in mind what you're trying to create artistically as well. And it's, I, I feel like it's easier in the front ensemble world because we have so many more uh, options from a palette standpoint because with today's marching activity, like we have field frames that we can mount just oodles upon oodles of stuff on. If we want impact drums, I mean, look at what Blue Knights did. Uh, they, they went with no cymbals and all impact drums. And those were great options. And you look at like what Phantom does and they mount more cymbals than any high school I've ever seen combined. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's all, it's all for palettes and sound. And now, Obviously, there's limitations to that. Like, what can your group do from a budgeting standpoint? But I'm always looking for ways as a writer to enhance the, the production, enhance the concept and what I'm trying to create. You know, sometimes, sometimes front ensembles will play things that, you know, melodically make sense. Like we're trying to enhance the, the melodic line or we're trying to do something harmonically. And then there's other times where it's like, all right, we just need to create some energy. So we need like, a lick. We need fast two mallets. We need fast four mallets. So it's going back and forth between like, what is the effect you're trying to create at any point in time, keeping that in mind? And what can you do to enhance that effect? And it's not always, it's not always beats, you know, especially on the front ensemble side of things. And that's why I have a pretty firm philosophy when I'm writing uh, for groups that can allow me to do it is I like to, and I've done this with Southwind, the moments where we play keyboard stuff and it needs to be impressive, there's going to be a lot of notes in that, in that chunk. You know, like we're going to push the world-class skill set as much as we can with the kids that we have. And then we're going to offset that by having chunks of time where we're playing, you know, the FX stacks and we're slamming chains and we're playing groove-based stuff that's not keyboard heavy or is very comp pattern stuff because that'll allow me to challenge the students but be artistically and idiomatically idiomatically correct for the interpretation of the music that we're playing so i try to keep all those things in mind when i'm designing a show and again the the budget of a program does have to come into consideration when you're thinking like that but there's more there's artistic choices you can make when you're allowed to do that that you can't necessarily do all the time other places sure and talking about those artistic choices going back to the 2019 show cage i mean 
there, there's so many different ways you can even just take that word. I mean, with, when you were riding for the front on someone, like you were saying, I remember we went to Home Depot and we, and we looked at those different metal sheets because cage, you have that metallic sound. So we have to get some type of metallic sound in there. And in your case, you were talking about pennies on the keys or maybe some type of metallic uh, string. Uh, but then also an idea for Cage from a design standpoint is that angst. And so you wrote in, in some of the movements, I mean, we had some cluster chords that were just like in your face, angry. But then like when the ballad came, what's the opposite of Cage? It's freedom. Right, so opening up that melodic content, both from a space uh, standpoint, rhythmically, but also just from a melodic harmonic standpoint, uh, and a very melodious and, and and more major happy sounding instead of so much of that angst. Uh, I think everything that we've talked about, whether whether you're just getting into the writing game or you've been writing for a long time, I think the most important facet factor in all this is just listening to music. Right. I loved how you, you mentioned, Ryan, how you, you saw, I guess it was maybe a percussion ensemble piece, and, and that's how you got your idea for that metal sheet. And then like Alanders and, and Rob, you guys have been talking a lot about uh, different drumline influences, different pop influences. And, and uh, I, I think it's just really important that as musicians, in order to study our craft, in order to find our own take in in the writing process you have to listen to what's come before you and that comes maybe a little not saying you have to get a music education uh, but learning a little bit more about the music history side of, of how music was started what's the purpose of it how it's grown you know the different phases baroque you know renaissance baroque uh and then romantic and then you have in the 20th century and, and then now and even in just not the classical side, but you have, you have the rhythmic structures of rap, you have uh, the folk uh, from indie, the, just like the instruments and the vocals. The most important thing I think all of us can say is you just have to listen to a wide, wide range of music. For me personally, I just love listening to soundtracks. So John Williams, Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman, some of my biggest influencers when I'm writing music. Uh, and even for creating that impact, a lot of EDM music, right? Some from uh, techno, trying to create that groove. Man, I wish, I wish we could be like talking more about this, but I'm looking at the time and, and we're kind of going over a little bit. So we're, we're just gonna have to end it there. Uh, Ryan, the Landers, and Robert, just want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, like I said, guys, if you're tuning into this, we, we can talk about this for many more hours, and we want to continue this conversation. So keep us send, sending your questions, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Until then, uh, again, thank you guys so much, and I guess we'll be signing off. Peace. Bye-bye.